Again, this is Tim Gaze with the Section 368 uh, Periodic Reaper Review National Project Manager uh, for the BLM Watch Office. On behalf of Bureau of Land Management and uh, the U.S. Forest Service as well as the Department of Energy and with Argo National Labs, who is our, uh, our primary contractor here in, in helping to do the heavy lifting for the effort, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to, to participate within the uh, uh, regional views of the West White Energy Corridors and uh, with your input to help develop recommendations for corridor changes. And today's webinar uh, will address the initiation of the West White Energy Corridor periodic review for Region 1, uh, which comes to Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Area. And uh, I'd like to uh, also uh, introduce uh, Georgia Ann Snell, uh, who is uh, illustrated there on the uh, intro slide. Uh, George Ann is the uh, Washington Office Program Lead for the Section 368 Energy Corridors, as well as uh, the Program Lead for uh, Transmission uh, there. So uh, with George Ann's assistance uh, or in Argonne's assistance, we'll basically give you an overview of the periodic reviews. And uh, because of our time, let's go ahead and get started. What I'd like to do is, uh, uh, for those of you in our intent with this uh, second webinar, uh, is to provide an opportunity for those who missed the first webinar on September 7th. Uh, so realizing that most folks are familiar uh, who have joined us today with the energy corridors, but some of you may not be, I will provide a brief background on the energy corridors. Uh, we'll talk about the three-year schedule that's in play with regard to conducting six regional reviews. Uh, we'll then focus on uh, how we're going to do each one of those regional reviews through a two-public uh, two or two-phase uh, public input process. Uh, we'll definitely want to get you oriented on what our end goal is, or what's our end product, uh, the land use plan, the constant land use plan recommendations. And then with Argonne's help, and I'll briefly touch on these, and, and Connie and staff will illustrate first of all, uh, we'll illustrate to you uh, two critical tools uh, that we've established or stood up to help facilitate stakeholder understanding and input for corridor, recommended corridor changes, and then we'll round out to basically give you a sense of uh, stakeholder engagement for folks that um, uh, you all are part of to uh, illustrate who we're, uh, who we're working with and, and continuing to expand our, our engagement with. So within that domain, uh, very briefly, a background on the energy corridors. Uh, as you folks may be aware, that Congress established in 2005 a very significant effort uh, that was an Energy Policy Act, a uh, number of very uh, substantial sections, but in particular there was Section 368, uh, which in essence uh, required uh, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, and assistance to the DOE to establish energy corridors uh, for 11 western states, uh, as you see in essence uh, uh, what's called the West Wide Energy Corridors. Uh, these corridors are largely for uh, oil, natural gas, or uh, related hydrocarbon, large diameter pipelines, 24 inches or larger, as well as major transmission and distribution power lines. And as a result of that act, and what the Bureau and the Forest Service engaged, we did uh, designate established 5,000 miles of corridors uh, which, uh, which was the result of 92 land use plan amendments uh, for the Bureau. And for the Forest Service, in a similar fashion, they designated a little less than 1,000 miles, 990 miles of corridors, again through 38 land use plan amendments, which identified allocation of those lands to support this type of, of, uh, of use. So, going on, um, for the 11 western states, uh, this map depicts the fact that of those 6,000 miles of corridors, we actually have 131 existing corridors. And as illustrated here, uh, those corridors are only located on U.S. Bureau of Land Management lands as well as Forest Service lands. Uh, the corridors are not continuous uh, as they may cross or the lots of placement of these corridors would result in uh, placement of infrastructure across state, uh, private lands, uh, or other uh, agency-administered 
lands. Um, the, uh, the important part of this is, is to uh, recognize uh, uh, the fact that uh, it is a west-wide uh, set and uh, going on. Now, within the uh, uh, the, uh, the work that was done with the corridors, uh, the Bureau was uh, uh, sued in 2009, uh, in essence, by a number of NGOs uh, uh, that uh, resulted in a settlement in 2012. Uh, a settlement uh, stood up an interagency working group and required uh, the development of settlement actions, which included um, the, uh, the requirement to do periodic regional reviews. An interagency work group uh, more or less established six regions uh, that, as uh, you folks may see, are largely geared towards the transmission uh, and pipeline related uh, groupings uh, of these regions. Uh, region one, as we see here towards uh, this, the uh, lower corner of the map, uh, here in Lavender encompasses Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. Uh, region 2, uh, primarily Eastern Arizona, uh, all of New Mexico, and Southern uh, Southern Colorado. Region 3 is the remainder of Northern Colorado, all of Utah, and a small part of Arizona, as is the Arizona Strip. And then also Eastern Nevada. Region 4 encompasses all of Wyoming, the Eastern two thirds of Montana. Region 5 will be the remaining western two-thirds of Nevada, uh, the majority of central and northern California, and then you see region 6, which is the western third of Montana, all of Idaho, as well as uh, Oregon and Washington. Uh, again, uh, these were established by an interagency oversight group of the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of the DOE, uh, and what we're doing is, is we're working towards the review of these specific regions. For Region 1, uh, which was which is our initial focus, and will provide a larger sense of all six, but for Region 1, as I just uh, described, we're looking at Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. Uh, region 1 has a total of 26 existing corridors on Bureau and Forest Service lands. Uh, of those 26, 20 are on Bureau lands, it's on U.S. Forest uh, lands. Uh, Golosu, also identified corridors of concern uh, that were identified by uh, the planet and the NGOs. Uh, those are delineated in red, uh, and it's important for all of us to be aware that uh, with the regional reviews that are being conducted, we were looking at all corridors and the potential for new candidate corridors uh, that stakeholders such as you all uh, will help us uh, recognize the need to be either added, added, uh, altered, or possibly removed. So again, the corridors of concern were identified with regard to the lawsuit settlement, uh, but we are looking at all corridors through the review process. So continuing on. Now, for those six uh, regions, uh, we have established a phased review schedule. Uh, as you see here, we're talking about Region 1 with Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. Uh, we began that work in earnest in April and May of this year. Uh, we're looking, and we'll explain more so, to conclude the public input process uh, and the, consult the creation of a set of recommendations on, on corridor modifications by the end of February. And then we will begin the work uh, towards the second uh, regional review in a phased process, which will encompass, as we mentioned, the remainder of Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern Colorado. Uh, and we have a slight overlap. We'll begin that project stand up in January, and we'll conclude in September. But each one of these encompasses primarily about nine months uh, worth of effort. Uh, Argonne National Lab, as Connie Westcott, who uh, uh, who you become aware that uh, led us into today's uh, webinar. Uh, Con and the Argonne National Staff are our primary uh, contract support resource for the Bureau and the Forest Service uh, to do these reviews and are, are facilitating the work. Uh, Argonne was uh, substantially involved with the uh, actually supported the work for the original programmatic EIS and the original corridor designations as well as assessment corridor study as part of the lawsuit. So over the next three plus years, uh, with your help, the 
are going through a phase process uh, with the assistance of our drive. And going on, now for each one of these regional reviews, uh, we actually have established a uh, two public input phases uh, that we need your assistance on. Uh, the first phase is geared towards obtaining stakeholder input on the region's corridors. What do you see that's good? What do you see that uh, uh, that has challenges? What would you recommend for uh, new considerations as far as alterations or, or possibly new candidate corridors? And that encompasses the first half of these nine-month reviews. Uh, the second phase is once we understand, we garner, we gather that input, uh, the Bureau of the Forest Service uh, field uh, offices, the BLM State Forest Service uh, regions will develop and finalize a draft set of corridor recommendations for that region. And these will be published for in draft format for a review by the public for a second uh, review phase. And then we work towards finalizing. Uh, Argonne has done a substantial amount of work here on the lead in to consolidate information to put you, uh, the agencies, the stakeholders in a position of knowledge with the corridors, and we'll illustrate that more so later through, uh, through the tools and through uh, the development of appropriate uh, information content. So, again, uh, the six regions in the phase, and then how we're approaching each regional review through the nine month process. Uh, through two input processes. Now, it's important for us, all of us, to recognize what's our end goal here? What's our product? Uh, the product is to develop uh, sets of land use plan recommendations uh, for each region, uh, and these encompass uh, the identification of corridors that need, may need to be added or possibly altered in some fashion. Uh, or the consideration to remove corridors if, uh, if, if reasons are, are of, uh, of, of a nature that would require such for those kinds of recommendations. These recommendations will actually reflect changes to land use plan later. Uh, these reviews are not uh, NEPA based. In fact, I mean, I'm losing some pixels on my cursor, but the review, what we're doing is not a NEPA process. Uh, NEPA will occur. Uh, when plans are amended, uh, those will coincide with either plan amendments in the future or new plan starts. Uh, the stakeholder input, like I mentioned, is geared towards uh, collecting information that will be used uh, uh, and integrated as part of the scoping process later. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that uh, ongoing planning is occurring. And as an example, within the Lynn Nevada, uh, uh, there is work as, uh, uh, on a new land use plan that's moving from a draft uh, to a final, uh, a final uh, version of that RMP. And in that case, corridor, uh, corridor alterations have actually been part of that public input and consideration for other land uses. Uh, so those will have influence uh, with regard to uh, either the fact that those recommendations are moving forward uh, or, or input has already been garnered and it will result in, in changes that are already possibly in play. Uh, another, another example would be the California DRACP, the Desert Renewable uh, Energy Conservation Plan, which in essence uh, uh, was established for uh, conservation action as well as the designation of, of uh, renewable energy development zones. Uh, those corridors were not analyzed uh, they are very wide, uh, have been there for a number of years, they're very well designed, and in this case, uh, the corridors have not changed, uh, but we recognize now with the conservation actions that we may have constraints uh, that may limit uh, what could possibly be done there. Further, it's important for folks to recognize that we have uh, either recently authorized or pending major transmission or pipeline project right away applications uh, that will, and we're already seeing, will provide insight on further corridor alterations, uh, additions or alterations. As an example, uh, we may have, uh, like Sunzia, uh, as you folks are well aware from New Mexico uh, uh, to and into Arizona, uh, Sunzia may follow the 268 corridor for part of their, uh, their project work, and in some places have actually stepped out of the corridor for a distance of, uh, of a segment, and they go back into the corridor. So we want to understand 
why was it necessary for them to step out of the corridor? And should we consider moving the corridor so it's in line with the Sun Z infrastructure and provide a mechanism for future corridor infrastructure uh, and subsequent projects to uh, to utilize, to be in a position uh, so that uh, collectively we're meeting the objectives of, uh, of the settlement requirement. So again, I think we wanted to do is definitely give you a sense on what our end products are. A very important part of this is the last bullet. Uh, we are specifically oriented and we have tooled up, and I think folks have come to realize that the GIS and geospatial uh, 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 approach is, is incumbent for this kind of work. It is very uh, spatially and map-based, a lot of resources of concern or issues, infrastructure. So what we're looking to do is develop a set of products from the reviews that are geospatially based with appropriate reference information or subordinate information that would be a substantial utility for the Bureau of the Forest Service and others who may be moving forward with uh, work in this same, same area. So again, we wanted to uh, make sure you understand the end product here uh, and the fact that we're, we're, we're asking for your input through a non through a, through a, uh, a non NEPA process. Uh, I did reference on the outline, and I'll just briefly touch on these. Argon will expand on this uh, through our webinar. We have developed uh, two tools uh, to facilitate stakeholder understanding and input. One is a tool that is uh, it's a concept of a corridor abstract. The abstract collects information uh, that Argon has, either from the PIS, uh, from a uh, from a, a subsequent uh, corridor study, which delineated how, how, how well have these corridors been utilized, uh, what problems may be inherent, uh, what futures uh, may exist. Uh, so the abstracts collect information and we communicate this. Argon has stood these up. Uh, many of you folks are familiar with these already. Uh, they're geared towards the premise of, uh, of giving you a good spatial understanding of what's involved. Here, in this case, the corridor is depicted in red for 3052, uh, which is in uh, Arizona. Uh, there's information on why the corridor was originally established, what infrastructure exists, uh, and attributes on various resources or opportunities. Again, Argon will display. And then this information has basically been broken out, further broken out into a table structure so that we can specifically identify where along the corridor uh, important criteria or insights uh, are important for us to share, whether they're resource or infrastructure concerns, uh, things of this nature. Our intent is, is with corridor abstracts, uh, to provide a mechanism so the stakeholders can understand, uh, identify what opportunities uh, may present that, we, that, we, that are important for us to recognize uh, what we need to do. Uh, we also want to make sure through the use of the abstracts that we focus, as, we focus stakeholder input to specific milepost or segments along those corridors. General input is, is obviously a value, but we want to make sure we tangibly identify uh, the issues to the point so we can work to address them. Uh, you know, our intent is, is the abstracts that themselves are very vital part of the still spatial data and the final recommendation uh, structure that will be in the play. Going on. Second tool, again, Akani and Argon, I want to help with Tim Kuiper today, uh, will illustrate to you uh, a Section 368 Energy Corridor Mapper uh, that stood up. It's an easy to use online uh, platform, uh, not unlike the solar mapper that Argon has done for the solar PEIS uh, for the Bureau, uh, a wind mapper tool that will be released soon uh, by the Bureau. Uh, the 368 mapper is oriented towards pulling a variety of data from, from various sources, many of which from our stakeholders as well. And the intent is, is to provide a means to allow you all to quickly get up to speed, understand what's going on, and help garner such a good uh, input. And towards that end, again, uh, those very same parameters, uh, our, our concept is, is this will be part of a tool to help support the geospatial uh, uh, recommendations and will can, can be and will be utilized towards uh, products that the land use plan uh, efforts will take advantage of later. Again, our objective is to identify adds, edits, or deletes to corridors to either uh, minimize constraints to corridors or address those constraints, as well as maximize uh, 
uh, opportunities. You know, what we recognize is, is when we need that, we need this, this, this energy, we want to do it best so it minimizes impacts to the landscape and provides a means for uh, those industries to do uh, what's necessary to support the public and needs. Now, closing out here on the collective initiation, we did want to take a minute and uh, give you a sense of our stakeholder engagement. Uh, we have initiated formal uh, Region 1 notification with uh, written correspondence to the governors of Arizona, California, and Nevada for Region 1. We've also notified uh, the governors in the other regions uh, so that their staffs can recognize that we, we will be moving towards that domain. Uh, we have written correspondence, notification, and engagement correspondence with the county commissioners in those states as well as uh, tribes and BIA uh, personnel, again, in Region 1, uh, both in BLM, California, uh, Nevada, and Arizona. Uh, work has been concluded and will be concluded on doing resource advisory council briefings. Uh, we've briefed the settlement plaintiffs and the NGOs. Uh, we've also, and this is very important on the last uh, check here, uh, is we have engaged the Western Electrical Coordinating Council uh, with uh, helping us understand for the Western Interconnect and the implications of these corridors where we would see high demand of an high utilization of existing infrastructure that would help us understand through energy futures such as coal retirements, high RPS in California, use of natural gas through its uh, low price, low price natural gas generation, what would happen at high price of natural gas returns um, and distributed generation we're seeing uh, that's a big part of Southern Nevada and Southern California. Those energy futures will have impacts and demands on Western interconnect, west-wide transmission infrastructure. So we work, we're working very closely with the entities that are illustrated here, the WEC, and we've also engaged within the California Rating 2.0 initiative so we can understand the energy futures and really help us understand where we may have demands on the need for new corridor uh, adjustments to corridors uh, and things of that nature. Uh, we are also and have initiated and we'll be doing a formal webinar uh, work for the Department of Defense. Uh, obviously our focus will be on Region 1, uh, but they are very, very much a part of what's in play. And then obviously, as underscored here, the industry. Uh, we want, and we did have uh, participation, and we want to expand this as much as we can to engage the, the industry that will utilize these corridors, whether it's the utilities, the transmission and pipeline. Uh, we've got uh, entities like the regional transmission planning uh, bodies that exist. Uh, we need their input through either uh, work like the WEX uh, common case or the 2016 common case or 2024-2026 common case or emerging insights on, on infrastructure uh, such as uh, the anchor data sets that may come from the regional planning uh, transmission entities and would be part of the WEX uh, larger study domain as well as you folks from the general public. Uh, the counties uh, which are definitely a very critical part of this I may add that uh, we did brief a small cadre of uh, state representatives from the Gov Western Governors Association, and we got sense from representatives in Idaho and Wyoming that they believe our timing is good here uh, to collectively work with the counties uh, who have been very much involved with transmission implications through zoning or land use planning, and it's an opportunity for us to adjust these corridors so that we can work in greater parity uh, with other stakeholders, including the counties, for the benefit of the industry and, and the public to support this kind of energy needs. I, I think so, Connie, uh, with that, I think we're just about there. I uh, wanted to take a minute and give you a little more detail with regard to uh, the phases one and two so that you have a little more sense. Uh, as I mentioned, we have been doing, uh, we have initiated uh, stakeholder notification with those uh, entities I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the first phase on conducting uh, stakeholder corridor input, uh, in essence, uh, has within it a 45 day window uh, that we've established. We put the abstracts out on the web for Region 1. We've got the mapper out that went out on September 9th. Uh, we did do a webinar on September 7th. 
Uh, we're doing our second set, uh, webinar here on the 29th. Uh, just this week, we concluded uh, three public outreach meetings, one in Arizona in public. A uh, week ago, last Tuesday, uh, we did uh, Palm Springs last Thursday uh, through a 9 to 3 uh, meeting with the public and, and stakeholders, as well as uh, this Tuesday, this week, we concluded a, a Las Vegas public meeting, and today we're doing a webinar too. So this really is an intended to get you folks oriented, to get you engaged, uh, to, uh, uh, to help you understand the process, uh, to address questions. Uh, and then through the end of this month, the 24th, uh, we will actually uh, uh, take recommendations from you all on corridor ads, edits, and deletes. And Argonne National Labs will compile those, uh, that information to a, to a faction that will basically be provided back to the Bureau of Field Offices in Region 1, uh, as well as the Forest Service. Uh, with Argonne's assistance, we'll develop a set of draft recommendations on corridor modifications, additions, or possible deletions. Those drafts will be published basically in mid-December. Uh, we will also, through this same process, conduct a webinar to orient folks to those uh, draft recommendations. We are planning to do uh, public outreach meetings again at the same three venues, same three locales, uh, and a follow-up webinar for folks to get so that approximately the end of January, uh, we would like your input on those recommendations for corridor changes. Argonne will then finalize those and we'll publish those in essence, so we'll conclude that work on those recommendations by the end of end of February. Uh, this same process will be used for regions two through six. Now, this is our first region. Uh, we may run into a few bumps or hiccups uh, uh, or circumstances that may require some changes to this basic structure. Uh, but in essence, this is uh, this is what we're going to go ahead and do. And uh, I think with that. Uh, we do want to illustrate, and this information is available on the website, that uh, uh, here are the principal points of contact. Uh, we have uh, information, as you see here, uh, down to and through uh, the corridor study that was done, uh, co a comment drop box, as well as Westwood Energy Corridor website, which Connie and his staff will explain more so about uh, at this point. So. Uh, Bonnie, I think we're at a point here. Maybe we can stop and entertain any questions that might have